when it says, for the Lord cometh forth out of his place, what do you think that will mean? Some people have a vision of the Lord coming back to earth and somehow what? You think that everyone's going to bow down and worship? I think the first thing he's going to do is look around to assess whether there is faith, true faith in him and secondarily to destroy, to tear down all of this false worship. If you read in the book of Revelation where we're talking about Babylon, the mystery whore that people would like to paint and say, well, I attach it to this religion or I attach it to that religion because it doesn't align and agree with my faith. It's every false religion that flies in the face of the living God. I'm taking you to the book of Micah. Uh, somebody like, huh, where? <laughs> what, what, that? <laughs> Okay, uh, page 1131, if you have a Bible like mine, that doesn't actually have a number on that page, how's that? But it's after the book of Jonah. So let me just give a little explanation of why. Obviously, I want to be able to explore all the books of the Bible together and open up things. Part of the problem, though, when we're dealing with, and this is part of the minor prophets, there are major prophets, these are part of the minor prophets, is it's very hard to distinguish prophecies like this. Um, sometimes it's been described here as, you know, if you're looking at a mountain range and you're looking straight at the mountains, you cannot necessarily see that what's behind the first mount may be a valley and the next mountain may not actually be as close to what you see, so perception of things. And I'm using that to describe things perhaps present or a gap of time in between as a valley uh, or things that are future time. And a lot of times of what happens in prophecy and when people start to treat these prophetic books, it's very important that we understand a couple of premise here. First of all, that, for example, in the book of Micah, you're going to see there's this, the, the, there are these abrupt shifts from present to future, sometimes without even, it's very choppy, it's very jerky, it's very hard to understand how somebody can be talking and from one moment talk about something that is, listen carefully, when uttered by Micah was yet to be fulfilled but has been fulfilled, versus things that, when uttered by Micah, have not yet been fulfilled and will be fulfilled in the future. So a lot of times people get into trouble in their interpretations. And so I also want to remind you that there's also what we call the rule of double interpretation, which is sometimes something is meant to be interpreted as prophetic, fulfilled, but may have a double meaning for a future time. And that all sounds very complicated, I know. So let me try and get into this, and then I'm going to show you some diagrams that might freak you out. <laughs> so, um, Okay, first of all, Micah. His name means who is like Jehovah. In fact, towards the end of the book, the seventh chapter, the 18th verse, there's a play on his name in the Hebrew where he's, he asks, who is a God like unto thee? And unfortunately, we have a great injustice for English readers because there's so much within many of these prophetic books, but specifically we're looking at Micah today, that we cannot see either a play or a pun on words that you could plainly see if you were reading it and translating it directly from the Hebrew. So what I want to show you before I get started, to show you a little bit of how this could be confusing, and please do not look at my chicken scratch. There's a lot of stuff that is on here, just bear with me. So what is in orange is unfulfilled. What is in green is fulfilled. So that, for example, would be the first chapter. I'm just gonna place them one on top of each other. So you can see what I've done, fulfilled, and I've labeled them. There's actually 10 different prophecies 
uh, in this book, and I've tried to label them and itemize them. So you can see fourth prophecy, what's fulfilled, what's yet to come, fifth prophecy, sixth prophecy, you can see both fulfilled and unfulfilled. And again, and then there are some parts I didn't even bother to highlight because there's so much in there to pick apart. And even within one verse, there may be a split between present, which would have been a future now fulfilled and something yet to be fulfilled. But you can see throughout the whole book, and as you get into the seventh chapter, beginning at the seventh verse, straight way to the end, you have a lot of things that have not yet been fulfilled. Why is this book of interest to us? Well, A, it's in the Bible, so that's a good start. But something else, and I really was trying to think about this to put this in the clearest terms. You're going to read uh, what I would call a summons to a nation almost on trial. And why this all came about in the prophet's day, and he's very much aligned with Isaiah. Uh, Micah is a country prophet like Amos, but different than Isaiah, who was a prophet to a kingly court. This man basically a little bit more earthy went out and tried to tell the people, wake up. What grips me in this is that basically this whole book revolves around idolatry. And we can say that the indictments are against, um, you, you'll see repeatedly Judah, uh, Israel, Jerusalem, Samaria. These are the names that will keep coming up. But basically, the indictment is that both north and south, so the whole, we'll now look at the whole of a country, basically got into idolatry. And I really, I, I don't want you to think right now of idols like you think in the olden days in antiquity. I want you to think of where this country is right now and where we are as a people and how even the most maybe seemingly insignificant things have become idolatrous. In a nation that basically has lost its moorings, that's completely confused about what's important. Uh, as I said before, the perversion of our children and the perversion of our educational system and the corruption of our justice system. But is all of that rooted in something else? And the answer is absolutely yes. And everything kind of dovetails back to a certain form of worship other than the worship of God. And you can become worshipful of people or of ideologies. So this book, although it does, we're going to look at things that have been fulfilled and future things yet to come. It speaks volumes to me. For example, I'll just read this one passage right here uh, in the opening chapter, which is yet to come. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains shall be molten under him and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Now, that is a future time describing a future event and we know that because you could read this out of other passages like Zechariah 14 where it talks about the um, landscape even changing when Jesus comes back. But I want you to think about something. The epicenter of this book, and specifically of this writing, happens to be at the heart of worship. Let's just say specifically we're talking about Jerusalem. And in a future time, yet to be fulfilled, that will be the epicenter of many things to unfold in a future time. Now, follow my logic here, because there's, as I said, two rules here, two things that must be applied. What happened in Micah's day, which is the people that basically turned, and we know the source, and we know the root of how they started to worship idols, Baal, different gods, but I want you to think of 
the epicenter today of Jerusalem. And I want you to think of the fact that most of the, we'll call them the major religions of the world, share a small little piece of land. And within that land, if you really think about it, some may look upon that land and say, it's the most religious and it's the most holy. Well, it is a holy place. But it is replete with idolatrous behavior right now as we speak. If you look at the celebrations of Easter, where people are going into a place to venerate, to bow down and worship at a shrine, which may or may not be the grave of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a form of idolatry right there. You can call it whatever you want. But when you look at the processionals that go through the streets and what's carried through the streets under the guise of worship, that's idolatry. And even our brothers and sisters who worship at the Wailing Wall and think that's a holy site, and it is. But when something takes the place of God, it has become an idol. It's as though generation after generation reading this book has a deaf ear to the fact that at the heart of humankind, we have a penchant to find something tangible to worship. That's our nature. We're wired in that very corrupt way. So don't think that this book is simply about Micah's time because it, as you'll see, it has a lot to do and ties in with much of the behavior that goes on today. A clarion call, by the way, the book opens with the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And right there in the opening part of this book, we know the span of Micah's ministry. Um, now, let, let me kind of touch a little bit on the historical part, which may be a little bit boring to some of you, but I'm going to actually pull up parts of the Bible that confirm these historical events. So, um, Jotham was from 742 to 735 BC, and as I said, to Hezekiah's time goes from 715 to 686 BC, when the Neo Assyrian Empire was gaining momentum. This empire had an invincible shell, a large body of professional mercenaries um, that would basically function. Uh, they were paid by the tribute of basically what they plundered in their conquests. And they were viewed as a force potentially that could not be taken down. We know what history records, their ultimate demise. But during, we'll call it the time of their gaining momentum, it seemed as though they were unstoppable. Um, when Tiglath Pileser inaugurated the last of Assyria's great imperial expansion, expansions entering through Israel's coastal plains in 734 BC. These are all historical events. Don't just go, oh, it's Bible prophecy. These are backed up in history, in history books. So you, you, you'd do well to tie these together. Um, but basically, they occupy the area around Galilee uh, and put the puppet king, Hosea, on the throne. Then you have a descendant of Tiglath Pileser, Shalmaneser V, who attacked Samaria from 725 to 722, and it fell to Sargon II, another successor, uh, to ensure that control of the Assyrian forces was guaranteed, a deportation of many of the inhabitants occurred. The kingdom to the north, Samaria became uh, an Assyrian province, and again, the, the Assyrians would, uh, would invade in several waves. Um, the first one, the first of the last major one started in 721, and the final one occurs in 701 with the most devastating blow to Judah. So after Sennacherib succeeds Saragon II, King Hezekiah joins forces with the evil Merodach Baladin, who held Babylonia. You read about that. I'm going to take you to a few places. So those of you who are interested in being able to go back and do the research can start 
putting these things together. Second Kings, Second Kings 20. And this will also appear in Isaiah 39. As I said, Micah is definitely writing in a different place than Isaiah, but they basically receive many of the same word of the Lord messages. So you'll find this as well in Isaiah 39. But starting at verse 12, so 2 Kings 20, starting at verse 12, at that time, I should, by the way, I should also say that Hezekiah had just gotten sick. And basically there's a whole passage before that if you want to read about it. But beginning at verse 12, at that time, and if you have a Bible like mine, you're going to see in the margin it will say Merodach, but it, your King James reads Beradoc, Baladin, the son of Baladin, the king of Babylonia, or Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, showed them all of the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in his, all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. So you can see here, Hezekiah makes an allegiance with the king of Babylon uh, under the guise, by the way, to try and fend off the enemy. He'll make another bad allegiance uh, with Egypt, and I think that is not too far away. It talks about him leaning on the staff of Egypt. So he makes these two associations, Hezekiah does. These, we'll call them coalition forces, but they're all wrong. They are enemies of God, and you just read with me, Hezekiah can't stop himself from flapping his jaw and showing everything that's in the house. Let me show you all my gold and all my silver. You know the expression, loose lips sink ships? Well, that's a lesson that this Hezekiah should have known because ultimately when the stuff hits the fan, they know where everything is. And when people say, what happened to all the splendor that was within the possession of Hezekiah? Don't ask. He revealed it all to these enemies who eventually will raid and sack and carry away most of these items. So, duh. And as I said, this is not an, it's a very difficult way to tackle this. So as I said, forgive me if we kind of go all over the place. Um, but you're going to see that there are some very interesting components and I'm, I'm going to try and stay within chapter 1, although that may be difficult. I may have to go to other places. But let me start first by reading. The word of the Lord that came unto Micah the Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So here begins, as I said, this, uh, we'll call it indictment. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now remember I said to you, verses 3 and 4 are a future time. This is actually the first prophecy of this book unfulfilled. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, referencing, by the way, what just was said, his holy temple, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountain shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be cleft as wax before fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. And again, I would strongly urge you, if you're going to look something like this up, you might find a reference in Isaiah 26, 21 to this similar thing, as I said, Zechariah 14, 4, and other places that describe when the Lord comes, how certain topographical elements of the earth are going to be changed. That's just a fact. So, um, not yet dealt with. You may say, well, didn't the people get dealt with as um, God let the invaders come right to the door and the gate of Jerusalem and basically sack and carry away the people? Yes, but the final 
we'll call it judgment on the earth, is not yet. And if you read this very carefully, it really kind of lends to the fact that when the Lord does return, there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to be very surprised and thinking that their, their form of worship, which I just tried to say to you at the, the beginning, can be very idolatrous, even though the intent may be worshipful and desirous and seemingly spiritual. The minute you are bowing down at anything else but the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, you are essentially worshiping something other than God. It could be the likeness of God in an image. This is why I rail constantly against a lot of practices done in the Catholic Church. Not all the Catholic Church, but the vast majority of the Catholic Church bows down to shrines and statues of Mary. When we're clearly told this is a no-no, how could how could so many people be led so far astray? But then you read in this book and you see how that's possible. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? And when we're talking about that, referring to the northern kingdom specifically here, it's, that's a term being used to denote the northern kingdom, a very weird way of putting it. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So big problem here is what's happening in both places. Big problem that is historic, was essentially dealt with in part, but not completely. And then begins uh, the second prophecy, which begins at verse 6, which is for the most part, and I say for the most part, fulfilled. Let me put these up here. So I tried to itemize them in some way. And let me turn back here. So hopefully you don't have a shadow. You can start over here. But take a look. Therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field. So I tried to make these a little bit more clear. I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley. And you know that if you know the history of what happens when they finally attack the city, they pulled the stones of the city, the city walls, wherever they could reach, and they threw them down into the valley. That actually happened. Let me come back over here because it's almost easier to read. But I will discover the foundations thereof and all the graven images Let's see where we are there. And all the graven images will be beaten to pieces. And then you go down here. All the harlots thereof will be burned with fire. And all the idols thereof I will lay desolate. Seven, they will return to the hire of a harlot. For she gathered it of the hire of a harlot, and they shall return to the hire of a harlot. That is in reference to how they made many of the idols that they were worshiping from those monies, from wherever those monies came from. So think about that. All right. Then it says, I will wail and howl. That is the prophet himself. I will go stripped and naked. He is not the only prophet to do that. Isaiah did that. And there's a reason for it. They weren't just trying to be decently indecent. But basically, there was a point, if you were proclaiming grief or blasphemy, you might rip your garment. But if you were in this tremendous state, sometimes you put on sack and ash, you know, ash and sack. But here, basically, void of anything to denote the absolute, utter, we'll call it destitution of the situation, the direness of it all. So that's the prophet. I will make a wailing like the dragons and the mourning as the owls. He, the Assyrian invader, has come to the gates of Jerusalem. He will receive you of his standing. You will give presents to Moresheth, Gath, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, like one who is to be betrothed. The house of Achzib will be a lie to the kings of Israel. And that's all, by the way, I am just put it in easier English, I guess. I will bring an heir to you, O inhabitants of Marsha, 
Uh, Dullam, the glory of Israel, I'll explain that as well. And last but not least, if you read into verse 16, for they are gone into captivity from thee. And he's speaking, by the way, of, if you go back, thy delicate children. So he foretold, the prophet is foretelling, this is in his time had not yet happened, but then became fulfilled, therefore it is fulfilled. We know historically they did go into, uh, they were deported. What's important here is to understand that as I, I tried to itemize these to make them clear, you could historically go through, now there are parts of this that we can't adequately confirm. For example, the Acts of Micah himself, where it says he basically stripped and naked, made all these noises and everything else. We can't confirm that only solely to go to the Bible. That's our only place to try and reference that. But all of these other things can be confirmed in outside, external, historical records of what exactly happened, specifically from the multiple attacks right down to 701 BC. So these are pretty important if you're going to look at the record to say, what does this mean? And why does prophecy, by the way, fulfilled matter? Because a lot of people will say, well, how can we believe in what's in the Bible? And how can we know? And how can... Da, 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 da. Well, as I said last week regarding the test of a prophet, and that's, it is biblical, it says the test of a prophet, if what he says comes to pass. And the prophet is not saying, these are my words, hear me out. It's the word of the Lord that came to the prophet. So it's God using a human instrument to forewarn and basically tell people. Now, if you remember, I taught out of Jonah. Jonah's responsibility was to go and warn the people that they would turn and repent. You're not hearing that from this prophet. You're hearing judgment is going to be coming, and this is how it's going to happen. So, now I want you to read with me, because there's something very weird that happens beginning at verse 10. He says, Declare ye not at Gath, weep ye not at all, and there's a reason why he's saying that. Again, this takes a little explaining. He's basically saying, don't let our enemies know what will befall you, what evil is going to come upon you. Now, you've got to go back, if you don't know the background of Gath, to the stories of King David, and that will all make sense to you afterwards. But he says, don't declare it there because that's basically enemy territory, will be a laughing stock to our enemies. And then here starts a very interesting thing. Let me just tell you, as I was mentioning, Sennacherib, as he came through, he took 46 strong cities. Some of them are mentioned in the following verses. But what Micah does is very weird, and you cannot see it uh, in your English very well. It will not make sense to you. Uh, but there's a play on words that's going to happen. So let me first kind of, I'm going to go out of order for something to point out something to you. I want you to look at verse 13. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Now the reason why that is being said like that, and I'm highlighting that first, Lachish is where, Idolatry really was first introduced into Judah as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had done in Israel. And you go back and you read the story how he set up idols everywhere. That is the introduction, and basically Lachish is the place. It is the link between Judah and Israel regarding the worship of idols. And when he says, this will make sense now, she is the beginning of the sin of the daughters of Zion. That's to tell us, this is where it started. Now, bear with me when I say this. This is the place where it started. It's always been in the heart of man. Okay, don't, don't think this is mark the spot. We know when Abraham was called out of Ur of Chaldees that his dad and his whole family probably worshipped idols. And through time, we know this is what people have done. So I don't want you to think that 
This can only be interpreted one way in this case, which is that this is basically the genesis or the starting point where we started to see idols being put up here, there, and everywhere, first as a convenience, if you will, and then basically it overtook the land. Um, after Lachish, by the way, the Assyrians turned to Libna, and you can read about that in 2 Kings 19, 8 and 9. That's a historical reference. Now, let me go back and deal with these strange uh, things that are said here. So first, we have, it says here, in the house, and back in verse 10, I told you I'm going to be all over the map. In the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. You can't see this in the English, but the house of Aphra is the house of dust. So there's a play on words here. In the house of dust, roll yourself in the dust. There's pun and sarcasm going on. And then, I need to look at my notes because I've got a lot of notes on these particular uh, places being mentioned here. Okay. So, the next place we have, Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Sapphire, having, the same, having thy shame naked. Now, here's a weird thing. Sapphire is, think of it, we'll call it pleasant town. Okay, pleasantness or pleasant town. So basically, inhabitants of pleasant town, you will basically go away in shameful nakedness, not so pleasant. Can you start seeing the plays on words a little bit? They're puns. If you have the inclination and you have a capacity to read Hebrew, you might want to look this up in the Hebrew to see what I'm saying. Some of you who did Hebrew with me would probably like to take a look and see. In fact, I have something better blown up here. Uh, that would be probably a little bit more legible for those of you who uh, can read Hebrew. But you'll find that these names are just a, it's a play on the names. And the, the prophet is seemingly having a, a really good time mocking or punning or whatever you want to call it. Then he says, the inhabitant of Zan came not forth in the morning of Beth Ezel. He shall receive of you his standing. So Zan, Zanan, Zanan, inhabitants of the going out shall not go out. And Beth Ezel could be interpreted the people of the foundation or support who will lose their support or their foundation. For the inhabitant of Maroth, which is bitter, bitter town, basically you will wait in vain for good to come, but instead the bitter is going to remain because evil is going to come. Um, and he says there, they waited carefully for good, but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. And that is speaking, by the way, of the Assyrian that makes his way straight to the gate. Um, let me see if I've got oh, one more, which I do. As I already told you about Lachish, and what's interesting about this when it says, O oh, oh, thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. Um, this is kind of an interesting twist on words. You'll latch up your team. If you were reading this, it could connote. I'm not going to tell you it's verbatim. But basically, instead of charging, you're going to retreat. You're going in the wrong direction. And that's one interpretation. I'm not telling you it's necessarily the singular one because there's a lot of ambiguity in the Hebrew. Um, of course, she is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, which I just explained what, what that is. For the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore shalt thou give presents to Moresheth Gath, now, this is really hard to understand as an English writer, but think of it this way. Morasheth Gath um, could be definitely understood as giving presence as a type of a dowry. The, the word in the Hebrew could bring that meaning. Um, basically, if that is the meaning of that word, it would be likened to say, 
you're going to give a dowry, but it will be to the king of Assyria. In other words, all this is doom. It's not, there's nothing good here. The houses of Achzib will be allied to the kings of Israel, the very place that might have meant a uh, place where there would be no lie. That's what they will be to the kings of Israel. Yet I will bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marashath. He shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Now this is a very ambiguous passage, and I cannot tell you that there are not probably ten different ways to try and understand this. What I've taken from this is that the glory of Israel, which would be all the nobles and the nobility, will go in. If you remember what Adullam represented, we talked about the cave of Adullam in David's day, might represent the glory, the nobility, those people who were of high ranking going to take refuge in caves. Basically, this is not a pretty picture being painted by the prophet. It's a lot of gloom and doom. Then he says, Make thee bald and pull thee for thy delicate children. For, it says, Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. So, make thee bald was an expression used repeatedly in scripture. And I may have made a note of this somewhere. Yes. Um, if you want to see wh what that looks like and where it might occur, because I like to show you these things so you can see patterns that repeat. Um, if you turn to, if you'd like to turn, otherwise I'll read it to you, Isaiah 3 and 24. Um, if you read there, it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink, instead of girdle, a rent, instead of a well-set hair, baldness, Instead of a stomacher, a girding of the sackcloth. This is all in, in, in dire grief, sometimes mourning, sometimes of people, but usually of the land. And in Isaiah, it's certainly used that way. It appears again repeatedly, actually, in Isaiah, um, in Isaiah 15 and 2, where it says, Moab shall howl, howl over Nebo uh, and over Mediba, and all their heads shall be baldness, and every beard cut off. This goes on repeatedly. In fact, if you remember, even the prophet Ezekiel with his hair usually represents mourning, all right? So this thing right here, make thee bald, basically mourn for thy delicate children. And there's something very important being said here. The prophet is basically saying your future is going to be carted off in front of you in this deportation. The, the future hope of this people is going to be taken away. Make thee bald, mourn for thy delicate children, enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. So basically, he was foretelling what had not yet happened, which ultimately now has was fulfilled in history. They did go into captivity. And I want you to think of this book not only in terms of past prophecy and future fulfillment, but I also want you to think of what's happening today in this country, not around the world, not, not that I'm not interested around the world, I'm interested right now in this country. And if you don't think that you, can, you can't find parallels when the prophet said basically weep, for thy delicate children because they're being carted away into captivity. If you don't see a parallel to what's happening in today's universe, in today's society within this country, where our young people are basically being carted off mentally to places that a child should never even have to go or experience, save when they're much older and by their own choice, by their own volition. But if you can't see the parallels, Enough warning from this prophet, by the way, to the people in his day. And I, I actually think it's funny. He ridiculed each of these towns, and they're only a small spattering of the towns, as I said, the 46 strong cities that Sennacherib took along the way. But how many places can you think of in the land we live in that have basically become a ridicule? And all you have to do is look in our own state, look to the north, look to the south, see that there is no law being enforced. 
The people have basically departed, for the most part, in this state from following any form of God. It's mostly very godless. I'm sorry to tell you this, but somebody going out to kill an innocent person in the street, whether it's for their jewelry, their clothes, their car, or just because they felt like it, and no law is being enforced, and you don't think that we have a problem? I mean, this is very much relevant to today because there's a warning going out. There are very few people like myself saying, turn back. People need to turn back. You may not like hearing these words, turn back to God. Try to find the roots and the genesis from where your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents came from when this country was still burgeoning in a positive in a cohesive, not fragmented, not every man for himself, not a free-for-all. And if you can't see the parallels, specifically on this one, when I say looking at the delicate children, the population at large that has no moorings, no guidance, start with the people who are in charge. Don't say, well, you're going to start in the pulpit. I just told you there's probably... Too many people in pulpits that shouldn't be there, men or women, I'm not sexist there. If you are not teaching people the essence of God's word and what God still stands for today, this prophecy may have been fulfilled, but it's going to repeat itself just in the opening verses when it says, for the Lord cometh forth out of his place. What do you think that will mean? Some people have a vision of the Lord coming back to earth and somehow what? You think that everyone's going to bow down and worship? I think the first thing he's going to do is look around to assess whether there is faith, true faith, in him. And secondarily, to destroy, to tear down all of this false worship. If you read in the book of Revelation where we're talking about Babylon, the mystery whore that people would like to paint and say, well, I attach it to this religion or I attach it to that religion because it doesn't align and agree with my faith. It's every false religion that flies in the face of the living God. You can paint it and you can try and make it convenient in your mind and target one group, but all, sorry, all, even Protestants have committed the unpardonable sin in basically, whether it's luring people away by their greed and preaching the prosperity gospel or from preachers that stand for 30 minutes telling nice stories with fluttering eyes to try and make you feel good. It's a great feeling for the moment, but it will do nothing to warn you of the impending doom that this country is facing. And if you want to say globally, yeah, it's globally, but I'm concerned with where I stand right now. This is why this preaching prophecy is not something where you're going to leave here and feel warm and fuzzy, but what it does make you do is it makes you, it confirms, it validates. There's much that can be fortified in your faith. It can turn people who maybe had uh, a questionable faith in Christ and in the book to say, wait a minute, you're telling me that these things actually, and you can back them up historically? Yeah, as I said, some of these are chronicled in 2 Chron Kings and in the book of Chronicles. Others are chronicled in the prophecies of Isaiah, but there are plenty of other records that we can go to to trace many of these events to say, yes, they did happen. So you've got that important dimension to remember. Now, something else that I want to show you. Starting in the second chapter, and I'm not wanting to really get into the second chapter, but I want to show you starting in the second chapter, going all the way into th the third chapter. I just want you to look at, these are basically, and there's some of these are very strange that the prophet chronicles, but these are basically, I've chronicled 33 sins of Israel, and some of them are, are really bizarre, but they are actually, they start at um, the second chapter, verse 1, when it says, Woe to them that devise iniquity. So you'll see that's where I start. And take a look at some of the things that are chronicled against Israel. Plan evil upon their beds, 
carrying out their evil plans in the day, coveting fields, take them by violence, covet and take away homes by force, oppress a man in his house. They have risen up against God, rob people of their clothes. I mean, listen, this could be happening. This, this, this is almost a list of what goes on almost daily in this country. If you're not reading the news, I suggest you wake up. There's a lot of this going on. People in the middle of the street getting robbed of their jewelry and their clothes because they're wearing nice things. False prophets, which have always existed and still exist today. They hated the good, loved the evil. They, these, are, these get a little bit weird. The leaders pluck off the skin from my people, pull the flesh from their bones, eat the flesh of my people, flay the skin from off of them, break their bones, chop them into pieces, have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Prophets make my people err. I'd like to highlight that one because that's still going on today. There are still people under the guise of preaching Christ, under the guise of preaching or teaching the Bible in any way, shape, or form of whatever branch you choose that are still leading people to error. And again, I'm not going to elaborate on that if you can't figure that one out for yourself. Bite with their teeth, cry peace, but actually invoke or pursue war. Leaders of poor judgment, pervert all equity, murder, commit iniquity, take bribes. That sounds like the government, too. Priests teach for hire, prophets divine for money, lie about God's presence, claim immunity from evil doing. So you can see, I chronicled at least 33. These are the sins being chronicled of Israel. So why should we uh, take a look at this book and try to glean from this. Why? Because it, ta it really does speak not only of past rebellious behavior by God's people, but it speaks of a present rebellion that still is going on today as we speak, as people are basically uh, being misled. And we talk about priests that teach for hire or prophets that divine for money. Look at almost every, we'll call it, global ministry, all right? It's unfortunate we do, and we are on TV, but if you look at most of the ministries that are on TV, they are ministries for hire. It's all about money. It's fundraising. It's how to get people to give more so that they can keep feeding the machine so that they can buy bigger and better whatever it is they're buying. You know, you can glean a lot from this book. You might say far stretches, but the real thing I want to point out here is that if we as a country and a people don't begin to heed some of these, even though they are past warnings, they're warnings for the future. In fact, this book contains enough future things. Um, if you think about it, um, read with me verse in chapter 4. And it says, but in the last days, that tells you that's future time for sure. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord into the house of God, the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Many people don't understand the relevance of Jerusalem because they don't know prophecy, that that will be the epicenter for all things. You may say, well, isn't America important? It will be in some ways, and in some ways it will not be important at all. That's the problem, by the way, with us. We really think we've become so overly important in our own eyes, we've forgotten what is important. This speaks volumes to me. In fact, I was studying in another place out of Isaiah, and it speaks of, who will be coming and who will be flowing to that mountain it may surprise you. It talks about the people from the land of Kedar and the land of uh, Sheba. It's speaking of some of these people that will come from the lands of Saudi Arabia and what we call the Fertile Crescent. Some of these will come up to the Mount of God to worship the Messiah when he returns. This is very interesting that that's spelled out there and it also tells us of who will be the foes and who will create 
the greatest tumult on earth in the last days on earth here. So there's great value in analyzing the prophecy, not just to look historically, but to also heed it as a warning. We're going in the wrong direction. Our founding fathers had great clarity on how to establish, for example, law in this land. And they didn't just simply sit down and come up with the idea of the Constitution. The Constitution has its roots in the Magna Carta. And if you're not familiar with that, I suggest you learn about that. There have always been laws of the land. And unfortunately, we know during much of the Dark Ages, many of the laws of the lands became the laws of the church, which were nothing but perversions or warped ideologies under the guise to extract money from the poor people of the land, basically enrich the church. So we would do really well to look at these prophecies, not only in light of how the prophet looked at the people in his day, but how should we as believers understand and look at society of today and look at where we're at. You know, I used to think that somehow this country would escape some of what I'd call the wrath of God. But I think what we're seeing is God has, at least for a time, I'm not saying taken his hand off completely, but minimally turned his back a bit because, as I said, the law, which is rooted, by the way, in this law, which comes from this book, the origins of all law that come from this book, and have strayed away so much so that the expression wrong is right, left is right, right is left. There's no sense of direction. There is no spiritual compass, even for the vast majority of people in churches. Many people, I'm not saying here, because I've taught the first message I think that I have repeated overly, overtly is courage. That's the message of the Lord, courage. We are to be courageous people. We're not to be cowards. We're not to fear. But what do you see happening around you? What do you see the vast majority of people, even people of the faith, cowering in fear, running away, thinking somehow an exodus out of this country will solve the problem or an exodus out of this state? Now, this state has notoriously not been a solid, uh, not like a Bible Belt state where you have churches everywhere and churches are busting open at the seams because people are there on Sunday. California has been notoriously flaky for people attending and believing, and it's time for all of that to be put to the back to our history and recognize that if we don't band together as a believing body, faithing in the power of God to turn others back to the right way, to bring back the laws of the land, to instill and ensure that justice is being carried out. What hope do any of us have if right now everything's turned on its head? Even all you have to do is look at what's happened to our judges. And you tell me how the Constitution can be upheld. It cannot be. It will be parsed, it will be picked apart, and it will probably be pushed aside eventually. That means our rights as Americans, our rights as Christians, the right to express yourself, the right to bear arms, the right to be happy in this country, which supposedly was one of those inalienable rights that every human being that lives under the banner of the flag of this country should be able to enjoy, will not be able to. So when I say to you, this ties in prophetically, it's time for us to start looking at how we may be able to steer the course even slightly for this country beginning. It starts right here. It doesn't start in somebody else's pulpit. It doesn't start in somebody else's church. It doesn't start in somebody else's mind. It starts right here where you're listening, where you're hearing, where you're recognizing. We, as Christians, must not cower in fear. We must take this seriously. As I said, idolatry that has plagued the church, has plagued man since the beginning of time, but is at a heightened level. We just don't 
we don't view it as such because worshiping a great singer who sings in the church, well, they're so great and we just, we just adore them, we think they're great and we start to kind of almost build a cult following around them. That's as idolatrous as bowing down to a shrine dedicated to Mary. This is why it will become very evident, maybe not today, maybe not in this message, but in the next few messages, specifically regarding future events which we haven't yet dealt with. And there is a couple of them in here which are real doozers. When I say future events, we're talking about the last days. We're talking about, uh, there's probably a mention in here. It is very uh, ambiguous, but I believe it to be tied to the Battle of Armageddon. I believe that when we address all of these things, we'll recognize we must sift away the stuff that has become the distraction, the idols within the church, and get back to the business of teaching people about faith in Christ, looking unto him who is solely the author of our faith. No add-ons, no additions. We don't need shrines to different gods, to different deities, to different people. I'm sorry to my friends who are devout of other faiths. I respect whatever you want to believe, but my Bible teaches me and says abundantly clear, we are either following Christ, gathering with him, or scattering. We are either, we call ourselves Christians, that means followers or small Christ, followers of Christ. So if we are, who are we following? The people who are leading us astray in error, or are we having a relationship with the risen Lord? These are all the fundamental questions that I believe if people actually ask themselves, including for all the people who tune in online, who go to other churches, and I hear this all the time, I love your teaching, I also go to another church. I'm not opposed to that. Just understand, you are, like the expression, you are what you eat, food-wise. If you eat garbage, your body will be filled with garbage. Spiritually, if you are not taking in the Word of God, you've got just about that spiritual garbage that amounts to nothing, not even for your eternal salvation. So maybe it's time for me to start preaching the message like Micah, to turn back, although his was more of judgment and judgment to come. He does tell about the mercy and the love of God and the forgiveness of God towards the end. And by the way, if somebody's interested, what is the most important prophecy in this book is about seven or 800 years before Christ is born, this prophet predicts the birth of our Lord and Savior from the town that he'll be born at, from the place that he'll be born at. As I said, what's the test of a prophet? What he says comes to pass. So I think we're standing on pretty solid ground. I'm looking forward to mining the depths of this book. I don't want anyone to think that this message in itself was easy to take in because it's somewhat of an introduction, kind of throwing a lot of stuff at you. I'll do a little bit of review next week so that we can kind of move into a flow through the book and basically see what we can glean, both for understanding history and equally for looking at what may happen in the future. For right now, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.